Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm an alcoholic. My name is Mark. Um, Let's see here. Thank you, Andy, for asking me to speak. Um, if this doesn't go well, you guys can blame him. <laughs> if it go, um, Mary Beth, Joe, thank you for coming. Um, Alianta, is, is that how you say it? Two years? Congratulations. Um, 17 people introduced themselves as new, I think, 17 people. Um, I'd like to welcome you to a new way of life. Alcoholics Anonymous, here we have a, a way out on which we can absolutely agree. I, um, gotta let the nerves settle a little bit. I wasn't nervous till I got up here. <laughs> so, if you were like me when you got here, um, Felt like you might have missed out on a higher calling in life or that uh, there had to be more than life than what what I knew. If you feel that way, I'm here to tell you I believe that that started, at least for me, starting in these rooms right here, Alcoholics Anonymous. I, uh, I'm convinced had I not gotten sober, I wouldn't be alive. That's the way I drank. I, uh, I have a sobriety date, December the 28th, 2005, and I didn't, um, I didn't pick that date. My parole officer picked it for me. <laughs> I was chasing the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous because the judge wouldn't leave me alone because the parole officer was really, really nosy. And, uh, I'll get into that maybe a little bit later on. I, um, I came to Alcoholics Anonymous a broken man. I needed to get sober. Um, a really long time before I got sober. Everyone who knew me knew that I needed to be sober, except for me. And uh, so uh, I came here, came here not knowing really what to expect. I um, just to tell you a little bit, like I'm not going to try to bore you with war stories, and I hope I don't get off on that because I want to talk about Alcoholics Anonymous. But I should like give you a little background. And so, first of all, like, I grew up in this family where <clears throat> me and my brother, who is, like, 15 months older than me, you guys can hear me fine, right? Yeah. What? She, uh, put your hearing aid in, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, my stepmom and my stepdad were basically kind of people who said, you know, get out of the house, go play, and don't come back. Get out from underneath my feet. So, here we are at, like, in the first grade, we're running around the neighborhood, we're spitting, we're cussing, and we're smoking cigarettes like, you know, we're something. And this was all, like, in the first grade, and that's that's kind of like how I was brought up. Um, as, as time went on, um, by the time I was in the seventh grade, I would much rather skip class and drink with my friends than go to class, and that's what I did. Um, I had a, uh, where I'm from in Alabama, we had nightclubs, not bars. We had these nightclubs, and they would stay open to 4 in the morning. And the people I would go drink with, they would, like, want to leave at, like, 12 or 1 in the morning. And they would always ask me, are you coming? And I'd be like, no. You know what I mean? I'd shut the bar. I mean, the place closes at 4. Why would I go home? And so that's the way I drink. And I always prided myself on, on being able to outdrink these people because, you know, they had to go home and not me. I mean, you just can't hold your liquor, so, you know, I don't know. And I wouldn't go home. Now, I would get uh, arrested a lot of times and thrown in jail for the weekend for public drunkenness or something. And I would show up, like, on a Monday afternoon, and they would be like, where were you all weekend? And I would make up this story about how some older lady kidnapped me and held me hostage all weekend. <laughs> and that never happened. I was always in jail, but that was my story. And uh, so by the time I was 18... Um, Probably three or four months after my 18th birthday, I was arrested and charged with three felonies that all involved drinking. And uh, so 
I did a little jail time for my first time um, at 18 years old, and by the time all that was said and done, um, it took about two years to put all that stuff behind me. Um, I was 20 years old, and I, I got out of jail, and I said, you know what, I'm going to move to L.A. That was what I was going to do, move to L.A. And so I came out to California, and I never made it to L.A. because I stopped in beautiful San Diego first and made this my home. And my first few years here, um, I drank, and I didn't really do anything else. And I'll tell you this real quick, drugs are part of my story. But this is Alcoholics Anonymous, so I'm not going to talk about drugs, but just know that when I'm drinking, I'm doing drugs. And um, my favorite thing to drink is Mad Dog 2020. I'm not much of a beer drinker. I drink because I like the effect produced by alcohol. And when I drink, I drink to get drunk. I didn't drink to socialize or go to the restroom a lot, if you know what I mean. And uh, so my drinking um, is pretty bad. And this girl that I met, I was 21 years old, I moved to San Diego, I got a job, and I met this girl, and we moved in together, and it was like this, this was this was my rule, and I'm going to read some stuff out of the book, I don't want you guys to freak out, but um, kind of like, uh, I meet this girl and we move in together, and this is like my rule, here I am 21 years old trying to make rules in our house, like, her money was our money, <laughs> but my money was my money, Right? <laughs> It worked for like three years. I don't know why you're laughing, but uh, <laughs> so so um, so like that's 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 how it was. And um, so it says the alcoholic is like a tornado roaring his way through the lives of others. Hearts are broken. Sweet relationships are dead. Affections have been uprooted. Selfish and inconsiderate habits have kept the home in turmoil. And by me doing that, that's what exactly like what went on around that house right there. Turmoil all the time. And uh, she had a plan, and I went to work one day, and I know it was a plan because when I came home from work, the whole apartment was empty. The food, the couch, everything was gone except for my clothes. It was empty. And uh, I went into the restroom and written on the mirror in red lipstick in big letters was B-Y-E-E-E with an exclamation point. She'd had enough. And uh, so that's where that led. And then, um, so like my drinking, my drinking, around this time I started blacking out. And, and, and the reason I know this is because I would be someplace and end up someplace else and not know how I got there. So that's how I knew I was blacking out. And one morning I woke up and my face was stuck to the carpet. I, I, I don't know, I was at a party, I was with some people, and the last thing I remember is standing there drinking with some people. And the next thing I know, I wake up and I'm at home and I'm on my living room floor and my face is stuck to the carpet. And I come to and I peel my face off the floor and carpet fibers are stuck to my face. And I look down and there's a big puddle of blood. There's like a puddle of blood on the carpet where I bled through my mouth during the night. Um, and you know what I did? I started drinking and, uh, that's just how I drink. And then, um, so this, this, this story could just continue and continue, but like I met this other lady and, uh, we too lived together and, um, I did some really crazy shit with her and, uh, like I had this episode one time, I'd tell you about this episode I had. So like, <clears throat> I'm hearing shit in the walls, right? I'm having auditory and visual hallucinations to go along with it. Not only am I seeing the shit, I'm hearing the shit, so it makes it really real. <laughs> and so we live on this street where it's, if you didn't live on the street, you wouldn't have any business on the street. And I guess I was in bed, asleep, I don't know, but I woke up and I looked out the window and I saw this car pull up in front of our house. And I just jumped out of bed and I ran through the house screaming because I thought these people were here to kill me for some reason. And I jumped through a plate glass window and, and just rolled and got up and ran outside and, and she like she didn't know what the hell was going on she's freaking out so she calls the police because she's worried about me and the police show up and they ask me like what's wrong with you and I'm like I don't know you know I don't know and so I hadn't really broken any law so they couldn't arrest me so they take me to uh, the old county jail downtown they hold me for like eight hours because they think you know I'm under the influence which I was and so I get out of this jail like eight hours later, and it's like, 
How much time do I have? <laughs> really? You're kidding me, right? Get till five to nine. Okay. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> okay, so I uh, I get out of this jail at like two o'clock in the afternoon. The sun's high. They let me out. I go outside, and what they used to do is they'd let you out of the drunk tank. If anyone's ever been in the old county jail, probably, I don't know, but the old county jail, it's not there anymore. And they let me out, and I, I go outside, and um, I walk to the corner of the street. I'm in the city, obviously, and this lady pulls up. She's getting ready to make a right-hand turn, you know, and you can turn right on red. So she pulls up to do this right-hand turn, and she stops to check traffic, and I'm standing on the corner, and I thought she stopped to pick me up. (laughs) So I open the door, and I get in. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You can't make this up. (laughs) So I get in, I close the door, and she starts screaming. And I said, look, lady, calm down. God sent me. Right? (laughs) She really started screaming. And so, uh, luckily, the police or the deputies at the county jail, they just knew something wasn't right, and they were watching me, and they saw me get into her car, and they came running out, and they drug me out, and they threw me down on the sidewalk. And I'm pleading with her, you know, tell them I'm not going to hurt you and all this shit. And so they take me to county mental health because, man, something's wrong with this guy, right? And I still really haven't broken any law, so they couldn't charge me with anything. So they take me to county mental health. You know, the book talks about jails, institutions, and death. Well, death didn't happen to me, but all that other shit did. And I'm here to tell you for like, I don't know how many days. I know I was in there for three or four days, and I don't know how long it took for my my girlfriend at that time and my brother to come and visit me in this place but until they did I had no thought no thought I'll never forget like I I'm staring at the wall with my mouth hanging open with no thought like I'm gone I'm completely gone there's nothing left I'm like a vegetable and this is this is some true shit and uh so my brother comes to see me and and luckily I don't know what happened um by the grace of God, uh, my brother comes to see me, and when he walks into my my sight, into my vision, and I see him, I recognize him, and just like everything comes back, and it's not like just like that, boom, and and like I'm not out in left field anymore. It's, it's a trip, and so the doctor at this place tells me, he says, "Look, people that went where you went don't come back because I don't know what's going on. Like it's a miracle." People that go where you went don't come back. And at this time, like, I weighed 142 pounds. I was malnourished. I wasn't eating. I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't doing anything that a normal human being should do. And uh, he told me, like, I'm going to release you, and I suggest that you go out there and stay sober because if you go where you went right now, like, you may never come back again. So I am highly suggest, you know, I mean, but why would I listen to him? He's just a doctor. He doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. <laughs> so I didn't listen and I kept drinking and this girl that I'm talking about like when I met her she drank like I drank right and that was just great for me until she didn't drink like I drank she decided that she wanted to get her shit together and I really didn't want her to do that but she wanted it and she ended up going and getting her place and I got another place where we kind of like we're still together And somehow I manipulated her into thinking that I had straightened my act up. I got a job, you know, and and, and, uh, we ended up moving back in together after seven or eight, nine months. And the first day that we lived together, when we moved back in together, I got her drunk, right? And so, because that's just the kind of guy I am, I knew that that once I showed her what I had, she wasn't going to be able to say no, and she wasn't. And uh, so... She put up with me for a while, and finally she's like, boom, so out the door I went. And um, my drinking just continued, and uh, I met another, I met a real crazy one after that. And then, um, like, she was, she, 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 as far as I know, like, she's still out there. Um, she's still out there. And um, 
like that was 13 years ago. I haven't seen her, but I heard she's not doing too well. And uh, what happened was with her is in July of 1999, I was arrested by the Border Patrol for smuggling people across the border, United States border. And I'd done it a few times and I'd made some good money, but I'd only had like six or seven. And so it was pretty easy, but I got greedy. And the girl I was with at the time, she was greedy as well. And we went to do this pickup and we, like 13 of these people come running out to get into our van. And I'm like, no, 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 no. She's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Just think about it, right? And so I went with it and we didn't make it across. And so in July of 1999, I was arrested and I was charged with a lot of different stuff. And um, I was sent to federal prison. 40 months, and I did 36 months on a 40-month sentence because in federal prison you do 85% of your time. And so, um, of course, I was sent to this place that it held like 4,500 people. There were basketball courts, tennis courts. There were movie theaters, um, green grass everywhere. Like It was like a college campus minus the women. I mean, it wasn't bad. They had a band room, you know, all this stuff. Um, I mean, it wasn't bad. It really wasn't. And um, it wasn't bad enough, obviously. <laughs> because, because I drank while I was in there, and I drank when I got out. Now, the problem with drinking when I got out is the federal government... They like to stick you with 40 months like they did me, and then they want to say, oh, you got to be on parole, this federal probation or parole for the next five years. So they really kind of stick it to you. So, like, I lost control. I lost control by this time. And this is where things start to get bad. Not that they weren't bad before. <laughs> That's so, yeah, so this is the part where... And this, like, right here, man, I'm sure you, a lot of you guys have heard this before, but, like, right here, this is me. This is, like, the last four or five years of my drinking. For most normal folks, drinking means conviviality, companionship, and colorful imagination. It means release from care, boredom, and worry. It is joyous intimacy with friends and a feeling that life is good, but not so with us in those last days of heavy drinking. The old pleasures were gone. They were but memories, and this was true. This was true. Never could we recapture the great moments of the past. And man, I tried. I tried. <laughs> there was an insistent yearning to enjoy life as we once did, and a heartbreaking obsession that some new miracle of control would enable us to do it. There was always one more attempt and one more failure. And for me, in the last years of my drinking, that's how I went. So, like, I would, I would know, like, kind of like, I'm going to get in trouble here because I got to go see this pro, because because I got to go see this pro officer at least once a week, right? And I know I'm going to get in trouble for what I'm about to do, but the last time, the way I did it didn't work. So I'm going to do it this way. So here's how I'm going to do it this time to make it work, right? 22 times in a row. It didn't work. And she finally had enough. She was fed up. The only thing that saved me for 22, I'll say this, Alcoholics Anonymous, but 22 dirty tests in a row, okay? 22 dirties in a row. Um, the only thing that saved my ass was, was I kind of like manipulated her a little bit. I used to compliment her all the time. Um, I'd compliment her shoes or, or something, you know, and, and I would, I would like... <laughs> flirt with her, sort of, you know what I mean? I would. And, um, and I had a job, you know, and, and so I think, I think, I think those things, like she kept trying to give me chances. She would call me up and she'd say, Mr. Green, last week it was this, and you said next time it would be gone, but now I'm calling you because not only is it that, it's that, and now it's something else. What's going on? And I would manipulate her and, and just kept going and going. So like after 22 dirty tests, she finally had enough. She sent the she sent the police to my job. They arrested me, and I went back to federal prison one more time. So now I've done 36 months on this 40-month sentence. I do a six-month violation. 
Now I've done 42 months on a 40-month sentence. See where this goes? And um, so, like, I'm sitting in, in this federal prison again, and I'm looking out the window. This time they sent me to MCC. It wasn't so pretty. There was no green grass. There was no movie theater. There was none of those things. And I'm looking out the louvered windows on the 19th floor because you can't see straight out, and you, you can only see so far, but you could see part of Horton Plaza, and you could see people over there having a good time and just enjoying life. And I, I sat there that day. I'll never forget this, because I really meant this decision or this resolution I made on this day was I'm not doing this anymore. I'm fucking done. Excuse my language, but, like, I'm done. I'm done. I don't, I don't want to live this way anymore. That was the day I made a decision or a resolution, we should say, that I don't want to live this way anymore. I'm tired of it. There has to be more than more to life. I've missed a higher calling, you know what I mean? And uh, I really, really meant it, but it was just a resolution. So I get out of this place, and I held true to my word for about a year. I got a day job, and I got a night job, and all I did was work. I worked all day. I'd come home. I'd sleep for four, five hours. I'd wake up. I'd shower, and I'd go work all night. I'd get off of that job, go to the day job, and that's how it went. And I socked away lots of money, and I just couldn't spend money because I never, I was never awake. When I was home, I was sleeping. But all the money I made, I paid rent, bought a little food, and socked a lot of money away. And I'm testing, and my parole officer is so happy, like, you're doing great. And she calls me up one day, and she says, why don't you come down and see me? So I go down, and I see her, and this is like a year, maybe 13 months. I go see her one more time. She says, I want you to come and see me one more time. I want you to test, and if you do well, I'm going to take you off of testing. And before I even hung up the phone, the wheels were cranking, right? Cranking. So I rushed down there as fast as I could, gave her what she needed, she told me how proud she is of me and what a great job I'm doing. And before I even made it home, I was drunk. I was drunk. And this was during Hurricane Katrina. So five months, about five months, she didn't call me. And I'm every day. So, so let me back up just real quick and tell you that within two weeks of drinking, I lost the day job. Within two weeks of drinking because I couldn't show up to both jobs. And two or three weeks later, I lost a night job. But who cares? I had money socked away, right? So I drank and I partied all my money away until there was nothing left. And and thank God she called when she did because, like, I was on my last month. Like, I'd paid my rent and I couldn't pay any more rent. Like, I'm done. And she calls me up, and I tell her over the phone that I'm not doing so well. And she said, what happened? And I told her, I need help. I'm just, I'm just fucked up. You know what I mean? I don't know how to stay sober. I don't know how to live. That's what I told her. I don't know how to live. And that was my mantra when I first came to Alcoholics Anonymous for the people who are, there's people in this room who know me since the day I walked into this room. And I used to get up to the podium and be one of the things I would say, my name's Mark. I'm an alcoholic and I don't know how to live. And I didn't know how to live. And that's what I told her. And so she gave me a choice. She said, get help or go back inside. And, of course, I took the help. I wanted the help. Now, I wasn't sure I I really wanted to stay sober. If you would have told me I I was going to get sober and stay sober, like I would have told you you're crazy because that wasn't the plan. So, like, I was going to come in here. I had, by by the time that I went to see her after using and drinking, um, I had three months of paper left. So my plan was was to not get sober and stay sober. My plan was was to go to a rehab facility because I knew where one was that was four months. I got three months of paper, and if I do this four-month program, I'll be off of paper, and then I won't have to worry about her or the judge telling me what to do. And so that was my plan. And so she allowed me to go to rehab, and she said, excuse me, she said, I want you to find a place, and I did. So I, I found a place, and she said, well, what's the deal? And I said, well, there's a six- to eight-week waiting period. And she says, no, no, it's not going to work. Not for me. That's not going to work. And I'm like, yeah, but they promised me that they'd have a bed in six to eight weeks. Why won't that work? She says, because I'm not letting you stay out here running amok. 
She goes, I will let you go, but until then, I'm locking you up. And that's what she did. She locked me up. And when the bed came open, the guy from the rehab facility had to come and get me. She didn't trust me. I don't know. Can you imagine that? She didn't trust me. (laughs) Right? I'm a pretty good guy. I don't know why you can't trust me, right? But she didn't. And uh, so this guy picks me up, and that's what I did. And that's where my journey in Alcoholics Anonymous started. Now, the real crazy part for me in the beginning, mm, I want to tell you, my first year of sobriety was the most boring time that I've ever had in my life because I would wake up miserable and think, what the f- am I going to do with myself today? <laughs> like, how do these people, I mean, this sucks, right? That's how I felt. But again, if you told me I was going to get sober and stay sober, I would have told you you're out of your mind. And uh, so what happened was, is I uh, got off a of paper in three months, and the next thing I know, four months later, I'm still an Alcoholics Anonymous because I bought into the Kool-Aid, so to speak, right? But what happened for me was even back before, like when I told my parole officer that I didn't know how to live, I didn't tell her that this is one time, like I wasn't trying to manipulate her. I really meant what I said. I didn't fucking know how to live. And I was I was like, look, man, it's like, you know what? There's got to be more to life. That's like how I felt. I mean, sh- surely to God, this is not what life was meant to be. I mean, it's a struggle. You know what I mean? Um, and so... <clears throat> When I, when I found myself still in AA at like four months, a lot of that had to do with the monkey see, monkey do thing. That's what we do around here. You know what I mean? It's monkey see, monkey do. There's nothing original here, man. There's nothing. Everything you hear, you're going to hear thousands of times. And everything that I say or someone else says, it's usually because someone else has said it to us. That's how it works around here. But what happened for me was people were saying things like, hmm, I'm relatively comfortable in my own skin, you know. Um, I'm happy most of the time. I got a good life. There's ice cream in the refrigerator. (laughs) Spicoli. (laughs) Whatever that is, I've never had it. But but I tell you what, there's Haagen-Dazs in mine, so, you know. But yeah, that's like how it started for me, man, is because people were saying like they were having good times. They were having a good time in Alcoholics Anonymous. And like we're not a glum lot, you know what I mean? And I thought we were. And like that's what started for me. Um, and then, then, then I, like someone was sharing about this last night. And this is like, like I was thinking this shit's right on time because, because I like what the guy said. He's talking about the third step prayer how we turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understand Him. And if we're having trouble with God around here, like, we can just turn. You know what I mean? Turn towards a new way of living. You know, that psychic change sufficient enough to bring about recovery. Like, that's what I had around here. I had this I had this educational, spiritual awakening um, that I learned from Alcoholics Anonymous. And when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous again, like, I was a broken man. And I'll tell you this. What's happened for me since I've been in Alcoholics Anonymous? Um, I love being sober. I love it. I would not, I mean, at this very moment, I don't want to, like, give up my sobriety date for anything. It means the world to me. I've never had it so good. I've never had it so good. I'm comfortable in my skin most of the time. And I'm relatively happy most of the time. Um, I just love, like, the, the life that AA gave me, I wouldn't have unless I got sober. It's just, I mean, I, like I said in the beginning, I don't believe I'd be alive if I hadn't gotten sober. That's the way I drink, man. And, and I've seen, like, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer here, but I've seen lots. I've been sober for a long time. Yes, Joey, a long time. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming, by the way. Did I say that? So, yeah. um, So, like, I was talking, like, I've seen a lot of people die from this shit, man. And I've tried to help people that cannot or will not see our way of life. I mean, I can't make someone get sober. But, like, you know, the most recent one was a 22-year-old kid. 
I'm standing on the sidewalk talking to him at 3 o'clock in the morning. And I said, man, you should go to fucking rehab. Excuse my language. I try not to cuss. I said, you need to go to rehab, bro. I mean, you know, and he's like, I'm not doing rehab, man. I'm not. I'm not. And he just got fed up with me, threw up his hands and walked away. And I got a phone call two days later. He's dead. You know what I mean? And I mean, not to be a Debbie Downer, but I mean, we think it can't happen to us, but we all have an appointment with death, right? But alcohol can make us die before our time. So like, anyway, I'm going to get on to like what Alcoholics Anonymous has done for me and some of the things that I've got to do. So first of all, outside of being sober, at five years of sobriety, I went downtown San Diego. I got to a five two, right? I went to downtown San Diego and I made an appointment because I'm off of parole. So I go downtown, I make an appointment. I go upstairs to the seventh floor of the parole office and I tell them, hey, is Alicia, Alicia in? And they're like, well, who are you? And I tell them, and they said, well, do you have an appointment? I'm like, no, but I think she'll see me. And so they let her know I'm there, and she comes down, and she gets me. She's like, what What do you want? <laughs> right? And so I take her, she takes me into her office, and I told her, like, because this is something I felt like I had to do. I just told her, hey, thank you. I want you to know that I'm sober. I've been sober for five years, and I want to say thank you because you helped save my life. And I told her, you know, like, don't ever give up on guys like me. Give us a chance, you know, and and every now and then somebody will come through the system and stay sober. And I thanked her for that. And uh, so, and then other things I've got to do, like uh, I sponsor other men in Alcoholics Anonymous. And if you're like, like I say this, and I don't want to be sounding arrogant, but it probably will. We train sponsors here. That's what we do. I come to Alcoholics Anonymous because I want a newcomer to work the steps with. I troll for newcomers. That's one of the reasons. I Bring the body and the mind will follow. And uh, I'm telling you, everything you hear is a repeat. But uh, like, like how it works, like they gave me, they gave me the solution to Alcoholics Anonymous before, before the meeting even started, we heard the solution, how it works. There it is right there. That's how it works. And so like... Uh, you get up in the steps and it says, you know, you have to set right the wrongs that you've done in your life. And so I got to, at uh, like seven years of sobriety, I'd saved up some money and I was able to afford a plane ticket to go back home and spend time with my family, which I did for like, mm, the first time I went was six days, seven, six days. And then I went back a second time and stayed like 13 days. But each time I went back, I made amends to my family members. Um, my stepmother, who passed away after I made my amends to her, um, which I'm glad I got to do because that's something I didn't want to, you know, I'm glad I did that because now it, I don't have to worry about, like, something I should have did and I didn't do because I did it. I made amends to my father. I took my whole family, first off, and set them down one by one and made amends to each and every one of them for the things that I did. Like, and, you know, that's what I'm supposed to do in Alcoholics Anonymous. And then, like, don't get me wrong, I, I hung out with them and had fun, but I mean, the whole, the whole purpose of that was to make amends. And probably one of the best amends that I made <clears throat> was right here in San Diego to this little guy who owns this little store who used to give me credit. And I left, I'd go in there and I'd get stuff from him and maybe 10 or $12 worth of stuff. And this guy's struggling, you know, to stay afloat. He's got this little mom and pop store and, and he'd give me credit. And I got some stuff from him, like $11 worth of stuff, some bologna, some bread, some chips, because, you know, I had spent, you know, I'm spending my money on drinking at that time. And I, I never went in and paid the guy. I paid him usually, but this time I didn't pay him. <clears throat> and he hadn't seen me. I mean, this was well into my sobriety. I don't know, somewhere between five and seven years. I thought I should go see this guy and make an amends to him. And I walked into a store, and he, as soon as I walked in, the little bell, ding, ding, you know, he looks up, and he sees me, and his eyes get really big, like, you know, and uh, he just couldn't, like, believe that I came back to, like, give him his $11, and, and what I did is I gave him 20 I mean, what's the big deal? It's only 20 bucks. And I told him, you know, like, what I'm trying to do and, and why I have to set right the wrongs, you know, because I want to stay sober, and I told him I'm an alcoholic. And then... Um, I don't know, man, if, uh, let's see, how, how can I put this before I close out here? Like, I don't, I didn't come here because I earned a seat. I didn't come here because I deserved a seat. 
and it's important for me to say this, <clears throat> I came here because God's grace, you know, God's mercy, and his grace is, is because he gave me a gift that I do not deserve. And his mercy is because throughout my life, he didn't give me what I do deserve. And for the wrongs and the shit that I've done to other people in my lifetime, if, if you know, just a fraction of those things were to come back, if, if God wasn't merciful to a guy like me, just a fraction of what I've done to others would have happened to me, I'd be in a whole lot of pain. You know what I mean? And I can't imagine, like, the pain that I've caused others. And so, if you're new to Alcoholics Anonymous, or if you're not new, if you haven't taken the 12 steps, please do. And if you're having trouble with God, I'll tell you like this, um, like I was talking about earlier, don't think about it like as that. Just, just turn. Try to turn toward a new way of life. For me, I got here because I drank lots and lots of booze, right? Booze is what brought me to Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's never going to get any better. This is the, the truth. I'll say this and I'll be done. This is the truth of the matter for me. Trying to chase that old elusive feeling for me, I don't buy into the lie today. I may in the future, but I don't buy into that lie today. For me, it's never going to get any better than the last drink that I took. The most insane thing I can do in Alcoholics Anonymous, sober, is to pick up a first drink. I'm Mark. Thanks for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.